Okay, so in, in last lecture, we were discussing system context modeling and we, we finished that with some exercises. I saw a few of you who already submitted that the, the last exercise to me, maybe about 10 of you, uh, did a pretty good job. So it seems like uh, well, at least the 10 who actually submitted have a good grasp of the, of the material. So that's, that's definitely a good thing. I do strongly encourage that the rest of you who haven't completed that exercise to actually do submit that exercise to me by email. I'll give you feedback, usually no more than 24 hours, right? And obviously the night of the quiz, I'm, I'm usually on guard waiting for those emails to arrive because this is usually the peak hours. So, um, you know, that does happen. Um, now, in this lecture, we will be uh, looking at a new chapter, actually it was chapter seven already, all right? I know it seems like we're burning through the material. <laughs> Things uh, due, due to Corona time do tend to go a little bit faster than in, um, in regular, but still the way it is this course, I mean, it does speed up to the first few chapters, but then it slows down a little bit. Now, um, let me just begin here first by going to the white screen over here. Okay. So the whole point about this, I'm gonna delete that. The whole point about the system context modeling uh, questions because I thought those questions were yeah, yeah they're not graded I actually give you back feedback okay so I encourage you to do it they're not graded but I give you the feedback so it's as though I would have graded them. like I, you know you have a pretty good idea whether you got the question right or wrong and obviously the purpose of that exercise is so that you would be set up for your quizzes and you'd be set up for your uh, your uh, uh, your midterms as well okay so back again here let me just flip that. All right. So in system context modeling, we looked at the system, okay? And then we saw some external entities outside, all right? And the whole purpose was to realize that such an entity even existed to begin with. Otherwise, if we don't even recognize that such an external entity exists, we would have never figured out what is the different functionalities that they needed, okay? Now, in this exercise or in system context, sorry, in use case modeling, this is no longer the case. We've, we, we are approaching this from the perspective that we've already known the external entities, okay? We've connected it to the system. And now we wanna know, okay, what the heck did this guy want from us, okay? All right, so we represent that as those little question marks as use cases and the use cases come in that oval form that we're going to be seeing in a moment okay so now that we've recognized that a student is going to be dealing with our system now we're going to ask what is it that the student wants i mean eventually ultimately all systems do is they provide services okay so if you're going to connect with us with a system to to service it that doesn't happen if you're going to connect with a system to um I don't know, for whatever reason, well, obviously the case is you're only gonna to connect to the system because there's some sort of a functionality either you, you want or obviously that you're facilitating, all right? So the whole purpose about this use case modeling chapter is to now look at those use cases inside. And this is our first time that we're gonna be looking inside, okay? So it used to be that we're treating this thing as a black box, all right? Now, literally, the, what's going on, we're zooming in. We're actually gonna be zooming, we're gonna actually look at that middle box, we're gonna open up like this. It's the same exact box. Now, what does that mean, the same exact box? Means that when I'm doing my modeling and I'm creating different models, I need to keep the consistency there, okay? So if I'm holding a remote control in my hand, okay, guys at home can't see that, but it's just imagine any remote control that you have in your hand, right? And then, you have it on the front and then you flip it on the back. It's the same height. There's no way that from the front is one height and at the back is a different height. That's an inconsistent view, okay? Same deal with when you're zooming in, okay? All of us must have at some point opened up Google Maps at some point and say we've looked at a zoomed out version of the city of Riyadh, all right? And then say what one of the main streets, for example, would be King Fad Street, King, um, um, or uh, King Abdullah Street, northern ring right now if you zoom in if you zoom in you see more details right 
uh, where in the zoomed out version, you didn't see those details. But if you zoom in and suddenly the Northern Ring Road is not there anymore, something is off, all right? There's no way that when it's zoomed out, you see it. And when you zoom in, it's not there anymore, okay? Unless you're zooming in at the wrong area or a different area, okay? So now let me go back to the slides over here, okay? So we're gonna be talking about use case modeling in the chapter, okay? Now remember the requirements pyramid we began with, what's at the top? Okay, so you went into the cruise control mode as I go there. He's gonna keep talking, I'm just gonna keep lying. <laughs> All right, so that's a little curveball. So what's at the top, uh, guys at home? Let me see if the guys at home are paying attention. Needs, yes, Shatralina, good job. Yeah, so actually, Muhammad, yeah, the problem, exactly. This is what we're looking for. And it's really like 100% of the problem. So it's the needs. Let me just do this. Okay, what's the second one? What's the second layer? Solution. Okay, we're not yet at the solution. We're at yeah, features, Abdullah, good job. All right. And the last specifications, yes, the last layer would be the software specification. And at, all of this is happening in the requirements phase. Okay, all of this, we're still in the requirements phase. So we said before that in, this, in the needs layer, we're, we're, we're really just sorting out our problems with no idea of what the heck the solution could be. And the features, we start to limit the solution space a little bit, okay, by defining more of the problem, but more specifically, as a byproduct, we are limiting Shoya, the, uh, the, the solution space, and in the software specification, what we're doing is we're giving more details about the requirements, but in turn, we're also limiting more the, the solution phase, but that's fine. We're still in the requirements phase. After that, we hit the design phase, and this is a different course all completely, all right? Use case modeling comes into this area. Okay, it comes into this area over here. We're the software specification phase. Now, you can think of you, uh, system context modeling actually it's up there the needs features, okay? Where I'm just trying to figure out what is it that I have, okay? Um, not needs as in this is my problem, but rather, you know, in the sense that I'm not even thinking of any solution whatsoever. I'm just realizing I'm really, really just trying to understand what the problem that I have, okay? Now, when we see in use case modeling, we're getting to this gray area because you can see it's right at the edge, it's right at the border. And we said before, Although we like to think of it as a clear cut between the two different phases, it's never really that case. It's a little bit intertwined between them, but still use case modeling is a requirement thing, not a design activity. Five, what comes with the use case model? Obviously the use case diagram itself. Now you see that box, that's the same box that we're looking at in system context modeling. Now that we're looking inside, okay? We're zoomed in, okay? It used to be a small box, can't see anything inside, now it's a bigger box, okay? And that act as a stick man figure, that was one of the external entities. In system context modeling, we like to draw them as a box. In use case modeling, we draw them as a stick man figure. Big deal, not, not, not a big issue, yet. all right? Now, the reason is there was different communities that created this, and it's actually a different person called Devar Jacobson who actually created use case modeling. And when they, decided on the stick man figure was because a lot of the users were representing humans, okay? It, it is obviously not really the best notation to use stick man figures because not all of our actors are actually human, okay? For example, when we looked at the, 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 the heating system with the system, hardly any of these things are human beings, okay? Even the aquarium, we only had to operate everything else wasn't the case. We can, yeah. So this is part of the use case modeling notation that we can either uh, flip it to a box if we really want to, or uh, we can actually use what we call rich icons, okay? So you can actually, for, if this is a doctor, you can actually put in an icon of a doctor to be even more descriptive of what, what you're doing, all right? This is something called um, semantic transparency, where I don't need to explain the icon to you, the icon to you is already very, uh, it's very, very explanatory, okay? There's semantic transparent, there's semantic neutral, means like a box, doesn't tell you anything. And then the semantic inverse, okay? Like 
putting a doctor's icon to represent the thief. Okay, it's the complete opposite. Okay, so I've actually misled you intentionally here or unintentionally. Now, the other thing that comes with a use case model is a set of descriptions. I have to touch the screen, I keep forgetting that. Okay, it's a set of textual descriptions. Now these little ovals, these little circles that we see, those are the actual functionality that is needed by the actor that we're seeing outside. Matter of fact, these are, in other words, we say, these are the business reasons, the business cases, why this actor would bother to come deal with our system to begin with, all right? If, if the actor is not touching any of those bubbles, then from the perspective of the actor, why would I even bother interacting with that system? Okay, it's completely useless to me, all right? Now, bubbles, they're not just gonna stay as bubbles, okay, because we need to be more specific. This is where the word specification comes in. And each one of those bubbles is associated with a description, okay? There's a lot of templates that exist for describing use case models. You'll see one of those templates at the end of, of this lecture. But it comes with a set of description. And this is really, really the, the, the heart of the actual functionality comes in, okay? We flush it out. This is what we're trying to say. We flush it out. How is it that we actually flush it out? We're going to explain that in a moment. But let's take a look at this notation of the system itself. Remember, this was the actual box that we had in system context modeling. We're going to zoom in right now. All right. Notice something it is that the use cases, they're representing the services. And just like what I was explaining to you in system context, small things that always think about what's going to be inside that box to be code. Well, it's not going to be any different now that we have use cases. It's the use cases that are going to turn into code later on. So we got to keep that same thought process. Okay. Not suddenly because, you know, we're putting in use cases, then, you know, things can be there and devices and so on. No, it's still just code. We're software engineers. This is the only thing we're going to be creating is creating software at the end of the day. Okay actors never turn into code okay doesn't matter how enticing that is when they don't turn into code okay a student will remain a human student right uh, regardless of the system now obviously we might have representative of the student inside the system as code as in student.java that's fine but again it's the difference between changing the actor sitting outside into code Okay, it's kind of like watching a Matrix movie or something like that. Now, AI is code. All right. Could now, it's, it, hmm? it could be enough. Well, this is no, again, so an actor, or if it's an external entity. Now, oh. codes are fine. Codes are fine. It depends. It's a very good question. If I'm going to be creating the AI engine myself, then it's part of my system. If I'm going to be dealing with an AI engine sitting outside, all right, then uh, the AI engine is, is something that I, um, so what I'm looking for, it's an external entity. So then the AI engine will be a, an actor, okay? Although it's just a, a piece of software, okay? Uh, for example, a good example about this, about using the AI as an engine, um, you know, for example, Uber. Uber is using Google Maps, okay? And when you say, I want, Uber basically is actually using the same functionality that you've had when you're using Google Maps to say, I want to get from here to point A to point B. It's doing the same thing, but with a car and a passenger. Okay, you're at your home, that's point B. This is a car, it's point A, right? It's the same exact technology. Now, the routing thing, Uber didn't invent that. All right, it's just using what Google already had. Okay, so from Uber systems perspective, the AI engine of Google is an actor. Yeah. All right. Now, from Google Maps' perspective, the AI, which is its own, no, it's part of its system. You see how it goes? Yeah. All right. Now, very important use cases only talk about the function requirements. They don't talk about non functional requirements. Okay, we're, we have nothing here that we're going to be dealing with. The system should be developed in Java. Okay, we have nothing here that says system needs to be secure. We don't talk about this. We're talking about software specifications. Okay, so if you want to have the secure thing, fine, but give me the specific functional alternative. Okay, like I'm going to have username and password, I'm going to have retina scan. Yeah, these are the things that are fine. 
Okay, but just don't tell me I want the system to be secure. I want the system to be maintainable. That's too high a level of a non-function requirement for me to consider. Okay, give it to me at the function level, the things I'm going to do. Again, the things I'm going to deliberately write in code for. Remember, x equals x plus 1. Okay, so tell me that you wanted to add 1 to x. I'll deal with it. I can't really do anything about it in use case modeling to say that this needs to be done in 0 0.05 seconds. Okay, or milliseconds or whatever. All right. <clears throat> now let's take a, a revisit again about this active thing. Um, you'll notice there's a whole bunch of rules that you see, but you actually already know these rules. Okay, because those are the same rules that we had back in, back in system context modeling. Exactly right. Again, not because we zoomed in suddenly the rules change. Okay, but actors are anything that deal directly or interacts with the system directly we don't care about interaction between what the actor is outside and with other actors so the same thing that we said in system context modeling an actor it could be human being could be another system could be a device primary actors we like to define those as the ones who interact with us because they want a service secondary actors are those actors that we, the system, interact with them in order to facilitate a service for a primary actor? Okay. And I gave the whole ebook, you know, com e commerce purchasing thing where I I'm dealing with the credit card system to facilitate the purchase for another actor. Yes. Yes. Would be a secondary actor in this case. Yes. Exactly. Exactly. Um, since actors are things, okay, including human beings, they're nouns, they're not verbs, okay? So I should never ever see an actor called retrieve report. Yes, yes. Oh, I thought, oh, sorry, sorry. Okay, never mind. All right. Actors, they play a role, not an instance, okay? And it's, it's a class of users, all right? Now, the whole point why they're playing a role, not an instance, is because the instance itself in a different system could be playing a different role. Okay. And we're not going to be changing the functionality or changing anything because the instance itself changed. Yeah. Hassan joined the university as a student. Hassan left, came, saw him, right? From the system's perspective, a student left, a student, another student came. They're still the same thing. I'm not going to be changing the code because Hassan left and Sara came. Okay. Since they're all students. Now, the other thing too, at the university, Hassan is playing the role of, or Ace is playing the role of the student. Dr. Afar is playing the role of the professor. Okay. The system is interacting with both of us in a different way. If you go to a restaurant, okay, then Isa is a customer. I'm a customer too. Okay. The waiter or the software system that's at the restaurant is never going to be dealing with, or hunger station, for example, it's never going to be dealing with Isa in a different way than I am because I'm a professor and he is a, a student. Okay. That doesn't make sense. If you think about it, okay. All right. Now, those little boxes that we had before with the text in it that is actually describing the use cases, what are they actually describing? Okay. What we say is they're describing boundary level interactions. What does boundary level interactions mean? It's kind of like the interaction that you see just at the border between the actor and the system inside. Okay. So it's all describing this, the user does this, the system responds with that. The user does this, the system responds with that. And this whole bunch of interaction going, as you can see, zigzagging until some sort of a service is delivered at the end. Now, I'm going to just step out here for a second and switch. Logging in, and opening up the account. Yeah, yeah. I mean, there's all, I mean, for example, let's, let's take an example about an ATM machine as, as I'm pulling up the... Uh, the, the the whiteboard okay so you stand in front of an ATM machine the user gives an input of the the card system asks for the pin you give the pin the system asks for what is it they want to do today you say i want to do a withdrawal okay system asks how much you want all right you can see going back and forth until finally this the the atm machine prints the money now what's actually happening this is why we say use case modeling we're we're at the boundary i mean we're flirting with design but we're not actually doing design why i mean remember this last, last slide that we had before here we are we had the actor okay and what we've seen is we've seen something that looks like this all right but actually what's really happening is 
the system we're saying the user does this okay whatever it is for example i'm going to put in the the pin number and then the system okay that's obviously my system over here then going to ask for uh uh the what functionality you want today withdrawal deposit want to pay a bill and so on now what's actually we're requesting here okay here's going to be a whole bunch of code that's going to be written and you can think about it this way i'm actually telling the designers we're sitting over here okay this is my designer okay this is the input that i'm going to give the system this is the output that i'm expecting from the system your job somehow write me whatever code that given this input that is going to produce this output and again i'm going to give another input okay notice i'm not doing anything over here huh? because that's not really our job okay this could be a human being where there's no code being executed it could be another system again that's not really our point over here another input right and again more code is going to be executing okay until we get another output until it, finally at the end we actually have the service delivered okay so it's unlike your assignments that you did in se 100 or se 120 where you just you give it the input and it just runs marawada right you're you're running different parts of the code based on different inputs that you give it at different stages okay let me go back again to the slides with this one all right guys at home are you following me on this hope i did not well i can't act okay good good okay good right so again the golden rule let me just repeat this again that it, it we're talking about functional requirements not non-functional ones all right moving on okay now a, a very very important question this question trips up a lot of business analysts or even requirements engineers, uh, uh, even in the real world. You'll still see that from if you Google examples of use case diagrams being created for an industrial setting, you'll see the same problem existing over and over again. Now, another, another problem that we have in use case modeling is that people don't understand use case modeling are actually teaching use case modeling. So they're just disseminating you know, wrong information, fake news. <laughs> So to speak okay so a big question is five i'm going to write down this this boundary level interaction to talk about some sort of a functionality that's supposed to be offered how much should i write in there okay calibrating the size of the use case is usually a difficult very difficult thing for people to do okay now here's here here is one situation okay so i have a whole bunch of small use cases okay it says pick a phone get a dial tone dial number and you can see where this is going okay what am i doing actually what am i trying to do make a phone call exactly okay now in order to make a phone call i need to add those up in order to make that call so i would look at those use cases at the bottom as too small okay what I have at the bottom here is what is called functions. These are just functions, okay? All of this at the bottom is going to turn into code. Yes, sure. But I'm not really describing the purpose behind uh, the actor using the system, okay? One way to know that it is too small, A, is I have to add them up. Say so I have to do this. And then you're creating a chain, then this one, then this one, then this one. If you feel like you're doing this, then you're falling into what we call a functional decomposition trap. Another thing, another way I can check for myself that I haven't created a use case that is too small is cover the other use case and just pick one and say, would the actor want to do this on its own? For example, pick a phone, right? You'll seem rather insane if you just keep like picking up the phone and putting it down, pick up the phone and putting it down, pick up the phone and putting it down. Okay, that's absolutely meaningless. All right, so unless I want to perform some sort of functionality for it, all right, and another way to check for it, because okay, even then, sometimes this little point is not hammered to the student. Okay, think of it this way think of this as a selling point. Okay, you're selling phones at some sort of a store. Okay, 
what would you tell the act or the the customer in this case as a reason why to interact with this phone in other words a reason to buy this phone he would tell that uh, that customer that hey if you buy this phone you can make phone calls and then the customer say well this is actually a very useful feature for me yeah but if you tell them hey buy this phone and you can pick it up and put it down pick it up and put it down pick it up put it down then they say what the heck is this okay this is absolutely silly okay now i say this i say this because a lot of the times we see a lot of these administrative functionalities that they pop up into uh, use case diagram incorrectly. There's sometimes it's okay, but a lot of times it's not. Okay. For example, the whole um, sign up. Okay. Sign up is not really a business case. Okay. Signing up and or, or registering an account. Standard. Not about standard. It's not really a reason, a business reason of that for you to use a particular software system. Okay, for example, let's take YouTube. I mean, imagine we're back in 19, oh, sorry, 2006 where YouTube was just, was just out. And imagine you, you're telling your friends about this thing called YouTube and right, what would you tell them? Okay, you would tell them, hey, there's this website and you can watch a lot of videos, right? A lot of funny videos, a lot of this videos and so on, right? I mean, obviously you can register an account and have, uh, but you'll never tell your friends, hey, I found this website, it's awesome. One of the best things you can do about it is that you can register an account over there. I can register an account everywhere. It's just for administrative purposes, but in itself is not a reason why I created. Okay. And, and usually you like to don't have those administrative functionalities showing up on the use case. Okay. Another way to think about it as well, right? You're going to show that use case diagram to the customer and they're going to pay for that system to be developed. Okay. You don't really want to be showing them, say, oh, you're going to create an account, you can delete an account, you can edit the name on an account. But right? you're showing them the reasons why we're creating, the reason why we're actually paying all this money. These things you can do with it. You can, for example, for a hotel, you can reserve a room. Okay. You can ask for certain amenities. You can do this, you can do that, right? So that's too small. But there's also a, a risk of doing things that are too big. For example, let's take this use case over here at the top says use phone, right? So if I ask you, go ahead, use your phone. What's the first thing you're gonna respond with? To do what, okay? That means I've given you a use case that is far too high level, okay? So if I ask myself, if, if you, the first thing you, you say, oh, okay, great, I got the use case, now I'm gonna program it. And you sit in front of your computer and you say, uh, okay, but to do what exactly? Right, and you have to, you feel like I have to go back again to get more details, then you know you've hit the situation where it's too big, okay? A lot of the problems that we see in use case modeling tend to be at the bottom situation rather than at the top situation, but you'll see, you'll see both. You'll definitely be seeing both, right? So what we want is that level in the middle that is just right, okay? So make a phone call, send a text message, set an alarm, okay? And the golden rule is one use case, one scenario, uh, so one service, okay? We'll see in a moment that we, there's certain situation where we can violate this rule as an exception when it's really, really justified, but we'll get, that, we'll get to that in a moment, okay? So now that we've described this, Let's describe the main relationship that exists between actors and the use cases. Okay, that's you can if you draw in the middle over here. Uh, this is the system boundary. Okay, so all of these association relationships are inter system and outside world. Okay, what we have over here is called an association. Let me just let you in on a secret. Uh, use case use case diagrams are part of the suite of diagrams that comes with UML. UML is something called the Unified Modeling Language. You know why it's called Unified? Because actually it was different people, three more specifically, who created those three diagrams, uh, sorry, three sets of diagrams, and then they decided to bring them all together. Because one person said, well, I, I'm doing this, it's good for the static view. I'm doing this, is good for the dynamic view. We're going to get to this in 3.10. 
okay? And one person said, well, I'm doing this for the analysis view or the requirements view, okay? And they realized that, well, all of these together that help us to model the entire system. So this is why it's called the unified. But in order to make it unified, some of the notation, its syntax, the meaning of the syntax of this notation has ended up being the same. Okay, so one of them is the associated relationship and it's the same exact definition as the association relationship that you'll see in use case diagram. I don't know if you've created something in two one, right? A class diagram with an association between them. Okay, now what is this saying? Class A associated with class B. From the simplest point of view that there is some sort of an interaction between, okay? That I'm gonna be dealing with you, you're gonna be dealing with me at some point. That's all that we're saying. We're not describing any sort of functionality, okay? With this association, all right? Describing of those functionalities this is what we need the dynamic models for. We're gonna to get to that in the next course, inshallah. Okay. Sometimes, sorry. Uh, no, no, no. U UML, UML is just like I said, is a collection of diagrams. Okay. One of those diagrams is use case modeling itself. Okay. Uh, I think I maybe I've confused you more than I've helped you with this. Okay. Uh, what I was trying to say is that some elements are going to be made consistent between the different diagrams that exist in UML. Okay. So the meaning of an association relation, the solid line that you see here, has the same exact meaning that you saw in class diagrams that maybe that you've created in 201. Okay. This is the point that I was trying to get at. If you didn't get it, it's all right, it's not a big deal. Okay. After maybe it was take 310, you look back at this and oh, okay, I think now I understand what Dr. Arthur is saying. Now, a use case diagram, you can think about it though, you're right. The first half is that it is a zoomed in version of the system context diagram that we created. Okay. What we're looking at now, because we figured out the actor, we were sitting outside, we figured it out. All right. Now we're saying, why is it that they want to interact with us? Okay. At first, we didn't even have that guy over here. Now we're asking why is there, they could be interacting with us for one use case, could be for two, three, four, five, right? And so on. Sometimes you see the direction of the arrow actually specified. So you can see an arrowhead at the end of that line over here. What do you think that that arrowhead means? Carlos, never? No, yeah, that's a bit extreme, but you're actually going and get, getting towards the right idea, okay? Uh, well, you're saying the same thing he said, but still, still close, close. You maybe took it a little bit too far. All right, it's actually specifying a little bit, something a little bit less. Yes. Say what? In what? Inflow. Inflow, all right. So inflow would be the answer that I, I definitely don't want to hear. <laughs> It's good that you said that, okay? I was waiting for a student to actually say that. A very common mistake is that this arrow is some sort of a data communication link that I, you know, the actor is just feeding a lot of information, okay? This is an associated relationship. It's not saying about what data I'm feeding, okay? All is saying that the actor is gonna be dealing with our system when it's executing this use case, okay? Now, the arrow means the arrow means that if I'm seeing an arrow going from the actor to the use case, it means that every time this interaction is initiated between the use case or the system and the actor, it is the actor that always initiates it. Okay, it's the one that always begins it. Okay, can you give me a good example of this? Yeah, the using of the phone or even putting the card to withdraw cash, right? You'll never see the ATM machine jumping up and down saying, use me, use me, use me, right? It never happens this way, okay? Actually, it could say use me, but it's never gonna actually grab you and put your card inside of it, right? It's not gonna happen like that. Same thing with your phone. It could suggest it, but it's never gonna, you know, get up, slap you in the face and say, call this person, right? And begins the phone call on your behalf, right? So a good... Situation for this is, for example, make a call where the actor who's 
pointing with the line is the color, because the color always begins. Okay. Now, when the arrow is pointing in the opposite direction, that means that this interaction between that actor and the system while that use case is executing is always initiated by hmm, the, the system. We we'll like to say the system itself or, or the use case. That's a more refined way of saying it. All right. So in this particular situation, what do you think this actor at the top? The colleague, exactly. Okay. Because the colleague is always having the phone actually initiating the interaction with the colleague, right? Otherwise, we're just going to be like, picking up something. did somebody call me? Did somebody call me? Did somebody call me, right? That's called polling. And we don't do that, okay? We actually wait for an interrupt mechanism to say, hey, you got a phone call there, all right? So back again to this solid line that we had before, okay? So we know when the arrow is going from left to right, we understand when the arrow is going from right to left. But what the heck does that solid line mean? Okay, that solid line means it's called, this is called the bi-directional association. This is what you commonly see all over the internet anyways, okay? Now, what does that mean is, is um, it, it's, it's an interaction that could begin by the system or it could begin by the actor themselves, okay? Anyone could begin that, okay? For example, reading emails, a lot of times you're actually uh, the whole process begins with the system asking you to, you know, how oh, you got an email, check this and so on, just be, you, it be, with a little notification or something like that. And sometimes it's the opposite. You're the one who decides, ah, let me check my email now. Okay. Now I know, I know with the phones and the notifications you get in the phones that even the calling could come at the opposite side as well, where the phone actually tells you, reminds you to call, hey, this person calls you, you might want to call them back again. It's, all right, and, and those examples are getting a little out of date, but you can think of the, the good old court phone for this, for this example, okay? All right, now, when we start to describe the functionalities of the use cases, this is the most important part, is the, is the actual documentations. What goes into those documentation we talked about is boundary level features, uh, interactions, but a lot of them would be repeated between the different use cases. So you're standing in front of an ATM machine. One of the things you can do is you can withdraw cash. Another thing you can do, you can deposit some cash. Another thing you can do, you can check about. A lot of these features, yeah, a lot of these use cases, a lot of the steps that happen in them are repetitive. All right. So this is why we need to be able to model this repetitiveness and have some sort of reuse mechanism. In encoding, the reuse mechanism comes in different flavors. The most obvious one, the first one we teach you is a function, okay? So that you don't have to repeat the function over and over and over and over again, okay? And one of the reasons why we tell you this is that uh, first, it makes your code look smaller, makes it easier to read. Easier to read means it's easier to understand. Easier to understand means I can change it if I want to. I can fix it if there's something wrong with it. And if I do change it, I have to change it in one place. I don't have to change it in 50 other places. Okay, this is what we teach you in SC100. Why is it that you should be using functions? All right. Um, sometimes you can actually see full on services using other full-on services, okay? For example, I want to withdraw cash, okay? And there's another service says check balance. Why, what's the point of repeating the code again for check balance on its own and checking the balance when I'm withdrawing the cash? Obviously you need to check the balance because you can't withdraw a thousand riyals and all you have is 10 riyals in your bank account, <laughs> right? Now there's no point in repeating the code again. And there's no point even rewriting that functionality again as in rewriting the requirements again. There's no point, I already wrote it once, okay? I just wanna make sure I connect them, okay? Now, again, the same reasons why we teach you in SC100, and like I said, functions is one of them. Another one reason, we, another one way we can reuse in SC100 programming is, for example, inheritance, right? Don't have to call anything, but you you inherit it. But anyway, and and and. Requirements engineering, yes, in use cases, uh, we can still need those reuse mechanisms. A lot of the things that you're gonna be writing could end up being repeated over and over and over again. A, it's a hassle. The documentation becomes much, much bigger. 
And then when it gets much bigger, it's harder to understand. If it's harder to understand, you get things wrong, right? Uh, there's misunderstandings, okay? Even the worst part of it all is that when I actually make a change, I want to make a change. Maintenance of this documentation becomes an absolute nightmare, okay? So for example, I want to make that change over here. You can see that lot, bottom line. Guys at home, you can see that bottom line turning red, okay? If I make that change over here, I have to make it all over the place, okay? And if I somehow, where did it get then? Very likely to happen, miss it over here and over there, then I have inconsistent documentation, okay? So you have my designer sitting over here. He's gonna grab one copy of this. He's either gonna grab this one, or he's gonna grab that one, okay? If he grabs this one, he grabs the new version, he grabs that one, he grabs the old version. We're basically putting out a recipe for disaster over here. All right. In use case modeling, we're given four mechanisms for reuse, okay? The first is called the include relationship. The second is called the extend relationship. All right, and then you see a little white gap before we introduce the other two. The third is called the generalization. Oh, you know about this, huh? Okay. Now, what this one you might not have taken the implementation. Implementation in use cases. All right. Well, we'll see if we got it right. Though. We'll, well, we'll see. We'll see. Okay. Now we're gonna dive into those relationships in a lot more detail. And, Operate. I'm expecting that. It's just an introduction to software engineering. But still, I'm impressed that you actually got gone all the way down to that, that. Usually, implementation relationship is not actually taught in about use case modeling. All right, you see a little white gap between those is because I like to think of them as that the first two are kind of like cousins of each other, and the second two are another pair of cousins. Okay. Now let's begin with the first one, the easiest one, the include relationship. Okay. The include relationship is the absolute easiest one because it really resembles the same mechanism that we had with the function calling that we did in programming, okay? So basically, I have a use case, including another use case, and notice the notation, huh? it's, it's a dotted line, okay? And then you put the word include with two square brackets around it, just making sure, right? And it is the base use case that includes, this is how we read it, it includes the inclusion use case. Okay, so this is my main function. This is my sub function, so to speak, so to speak. Okay, and what happens when function A calls function B? We teach you in SE100, it's like you've copied the code of function B back into function A in the same place where that call happened. All right, that call could have happened at the bottom at the end what could happen in the middle, at the top, sorry, or even in the middle, anywhere you want. The call could have happened multiple times even, okay? And all the while, this red box that you see over here is, is, is um, copy pasted into the original text over here. But in reality, I've written it only once. So it's not repeated. Exactly. Okay. I mean, effectively, it's getting repeated effectively when I flesh it out. Okay. Just like in the code, just like in SE100, it's effectively, I mean, if you function A calls function B five times, effectively, it's like you've copied the code five times. But in reality, what you've written in front of the computer is that you've written it one time. Okay. And this is what we want. So that if we want to change it, if we want to do it, we do it in one place. Okay. Plus, it makes the code smaller and easier to read, and we've already covered that. Okay. Now, think of it this way: that the nature of the relationship between those two. Okay. Uh, let's just say I have a use case. I'm going to dumb it down here a little bit. A use case for uh, calculating averages. Okay. Do you know the formula to calculate an average? You get like five numbers. How do I calculate the average for the five numbers? I add them up, then I divide. Okay. So part of the Calculating the average is addition, all right? Now, addition on its own could be a very useful function that I could be reusing somewhere else to calculate another formula, okay? So I could end up using the include for this. And this is actually how we would write down the code for the average function. 
okay, is that it actually calls the sum function and just puts it in a for loop. All right. So the average function is function A, and it's calling the, the, the add function, which is function B. Imagine if you don't actually have function B and somebody came in and deleted. What actually would happen at the code level? It would you would have a what? A missing functionality. You have a missing functionality. And what would they, what would happen if you have a missing functionality? It would give you an error. Exactly. It would actually give you an error. Okay. In other words, A tells function B, you complete me. All right. Do the Hollywood, uh, I don't know, you don't get it. Huh? Okay. It's an old movie. But anyway. <laughs> right. Um, so it says you complete. In other words, function A doesn't really function without what's actually written. So that relationship is not. Yeah, sometimes I'll use you, sometimes I, I have to use you every time. Okay, I cannot compute the average without computing the addition. All right. Here's another thing. All right. The average, definitely, we already established that needs the add function. The add function doesn't care about the average function at all. All right. And hence, you actually see the arrow pointing in that direction. It's a dependency. Okay, those dotted lines, what we call in UML as a dependency. It's who depends on who. Now, a lot of times we end up forgetting, ah, oh, which way should the arrow go, right? Think of it this way, you and your buddies, okay, you and your friends. If you need somebody, I'm gonna go look for, I'm gonna go be pointing at you, okay? If the other person doesn't need the first person, then naturally they're gonna be looking at their phone, not pointing at them, not searching for them at all. So it's who needs who, I'm gonna be coming and I'm gonna be looking for you. Going to be pointing because hey 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 can you just stop here for a second I just want to talk to you for a second right keep this in mind as we discuss the extend relationship in a moment right so we said that the base base use case is incomplete the inclusion is complete and think of it this way I like to put that symbol I created on my own okay just for the illustrative purposes think of it that that the base use case the white one it has the negative sign in it, it's incomplete, and then it's the oval. You can see it is completed by the inclusion, which I have it in red, red to symbolize the mandatory nature of it. Okay, kind of like a, when you're standing at the stoplight and you see red, you have to stop. Okay. Now, before we go into the extended relationship, I want to go back and revisit the whole thing about the functional decomposition. Okay. Now, functional decomposition, again, we start look at these reuse mechanisms, we, we get a hold of them, we start to master them and say, and then we go back again into crazy mode of break it down, break it down, break it down, break it down, break it down. Okay. And we start to create use cases. So we take out functionality from the original base. We pull it out. Okay, so for guys are at home, let's just say the validation of the pin happened over here. I pull it out over there. All right. So that I end up creating an artificial use case called validate pin, and I put in the included relationship there. Okay. Now imagine this. Imagine I have a very, very primitive ATM machine that does actually one thing and one thing only, unlike the ATM machines that exist nowadays. And that one thing that ATM machine does is it allows you to withdraw cash. Obviously, part of it job is to validate the pin because, you know, otherwise we'd be just withdrawing from each other's accounts. Right? Now, if this is the case, why do I need to look at a diagram that has two ovals, that has two use cases? Really, this thing this ATM machine does one thing, and I should be reading one thing only. And it's the one reason I'm actually approaching this machine to begin with. Okay. Nobody approaches an ATM machine because it can validate the pen. Like, yay, it validated my pen, so then I go leave. Okay? You go to the ATM machine because you want to withdraw the money. So if this is the case, I actually want to suck it back in. Okay? I want to take the validate pen, make it part of the withdrawing of the cash, okay? And again, I'm gonna say 
when is it that it's good to keep it outside in a moment, okay? And I, and you, I know you're probably thinking already, I can see other reasons why I should have the validate pin outside, which is good, okay? But we're still assuming the situation that that ATM machine did one thing and one thing only. If it does, then I should be seeing a box with one circle in it only saying, well, the only thing that this does is that it allows it to withdraw cash money, okay? All right. Um, one of the things that I said is take out or block this use case over here, just to know if you've done functional decomposition. Look at this one over there and see, would I want to do this by itself? You realize it's silly to just stand in front of an ATM machine, validate your pen and leave. So then you realize, okay, this is a red flag that I've done something wrong or went to functional decomposition. Now, when is it that it is okay to sort of like break that rule? Okay, and I think some of you, whoops, no, 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 no. I, uh, some of you might be a little bit onto this as we get. Okay, so this is my validate pin. Okay, this is one use case called Withdraw cash, okay? And we made it, so there's an include relationship as such. If it stays like this, then this is functional decomposition. I don't need it, okay? In other words, okay? In other words, let me just slide over here. If I have the situation over here, any use case, and it's an inclusion use case, Inclusion, okay, and it's being included by just one other use case, then automatically I should be thinking, grab this, okay, and put it back into the original use case, okay? Now, going back to this over here, if I wanna deposit cash, Still, you need to do some pin validation. Now it's okay. If it's being included by more than one use case, then it would be okay. All right. And now think about this thing to scale, right? A whole bunch of other use cases. So if I had six or seven different functions, a hundred different functionalities, all of them require the validation of the pen, then, right, I would have to copy paste the, the text, not just the code, the text for the validate pen all over the place, okay? And if pin validation, for some reason, its behavior or its procedure changes, then I have to change it all over the place. And I don't wanna do that. I wanna keep it in one place and one place only. All right. All right, so um, back again to the slide. Now, in programming, in SE100, okay, had that situation of function A calling function B and it's calling it one time and it's the only function that calls it happen, we tell you that's okay. It's still good to do this. It's good for modularity. You've come across this word before, having your code look in modules, i.e. consist of modules. We like to think of our code as component, not that one big fat main function. We like to think of it as, even if we're just calling it one time, it's just coming back again. It makes it easier to read, okay? I look at the main function, all I'm seeing is, I'm reading function calls, right? If I really wanted to know the details, I'll go down to that function, but if I don't, and I don't really care, for example, register in the course, how I get the idea from the name of the function. I don't even need to look at the code, okay? Now, the reason why this is okay in SE100 and SE120 and in programming in general is because programming, implementation, coding, uh, is in the design phase. We're in the part of divide and conquer so that we can provide a solution, 
So it's okay because we're in the solution domain. Requirements engineering is not in the solution domain. We're in the problem domain, okay? Now, what really happens in the problem domain is we see little bits of pieces of information all over the place. And it's our job to bring it together in order to understand the big picture, the big problem, okay? It's really just like, think about it this way. Have you ever seen one of those CSI episodes you know, that, that police investigation episode, it is a hundred law and order, hundreds of these different series that you can, you can watch, all right? And what happens on those episodes, those movies or those, those shows is that, you know, the police come, they see a little blood stain over there, uh, a finger uh, trace over the fingerprint over here. They see a little video tape over there. And all they're doing throughout the episode is exactly, they're bringing, they're, they're discovering little pieces and at the end, yes, of that investigation, what do you do? They piece it together, okay? So they see those little peas over here, over here. Oops. No, 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 no. Okay, we see those little peas over here. And at the end of the episode, they bring it all together. They say, okay, how is it that that blood spot came to be? How is it that print to print came to be? When we add it with the videotape that we saw, then we understand that this is the big picture. This is what happened that night of the murder and so on and so forth, okay? Requirements engineering is about understanding what the problem is, okay? We're doing a CSI episode in our work, so to speak, okay? So we're trying to just figure out the problem. After we figure it out the problem and we give it to the designer, it's up to the designer to do the divide and conquer. So you break down the problem into smaller problems, all right? And with it, you can figure out the solutions later on, all right? That's the work of the design team, okay? So this would be okay. On its own, it would not be okay. However, another situation, I forgot about this, okay? Another situation where it's okay to have an inclusion use case being included by one base use case is if that, that, that inclusion use case on its own is associated directly with an actor. What does that mean? Mean that what's actually inside that inclusion use case, the smaller use case is on its own beneficial for an actor. It's on its own a good enough reason for the actor to come and say, I want to use the system not because of the base, I wanna use it just for the inclusion. A classical example of this, the withdrawing of the cash requires of the checking of the balances. You might actually stand in front of an ATM machine just to know your balance. You don't have to withdraw cash just to know your balance. Some of them actually do it as a shortcut, but, <laughs> but if you really just wanted to know your balance, you should be able to know your balance without having to withdraw money. Now, again, this would be a case where, yes, the checking of the balance, I would take it out from the base use case, right? And I would put it on its own as an inclusion use case, okay? Type. Uh, one more relationship. Gonna look at the extend relationship. Now, remember I said that the include and the extend are cousins of each other and they kind of like, you know, uh, you, you zig, I zag, so to speak. Right. Now, the first thing that you should have noticed in the extend is that it's pointing the other way. Not to mention, obviously, the word extend is saying there rather clearly. Okay. Now, what is the nature of this relationship is that is that what I put inside what we call the extension use case. Okay. Not the base of so the extension is not the base is the other one is something that I'm adding to an extension to the base. Now, think of it, the word extension. We've seen, for example, a mall that has been extended. That means that a previous mall actually already existed. It was doing just fine. It didn't need the extension, okay? But we're just adding something to it, okay? So it means that obviously the base use case would have lived on it doesn't have to have it. So it's not like an automatic thing like with the include 
So this is why I would like to signify the extent with the yellow line, with the yellow color, okay? And with the include, I never have to put a condition. There's no if, I always need you. There's never the average function is gonna say to the sum, maybe I need you this time, maybe I don't. And this is the time that I need you, this is the time that I don't, okay? So I don't need a condition. Now, if it's something where I could say, hey, maybe this time I'll need you, maybe next time I won't, then I have to know based on what criteria would I actually do need you and what time that I won't, okay? So this goes into the condition and the condition, you see it written in that bra brackets that you see at the bottom over here and you write down the condition, okay? The reuse happens to be exactly the same. You're still adding that yellow text to the base, okay? You could add it at the bottom, you could add it at the top, you can add the middle, you can add it multiple times if you want to, okay? But it's it's not about the addition because everything is there all reuse. It's about the nature of the addition, all right? Um, like I said, that base would actually we consider that the complete the extension is in itself is what we consider the incomplete, which was the vice versa of what we had with the, uh, remember with the include, where the inclusion was actually the complete one is the one, the other one, the base was the incomplete one. Now think of it this way, okay? Um, before we get to that, you know, and this obviously I should need to update the phones that I'm using in my slides, but you, you got the phone. That's your base use case. You buy it, you put out the box, you're good, you're good to go, okay? Over here, that's the case, okay? You didn't have to buy the case. It's good for protection and all, but you didn't have to. I mean, the phone would have worked just fine without the case. So the case would be the extension, okay? Now imagine, so this is pretty obvious. Now imagine this. Imagine you don't have an iPhone 5. I don't expect anybody actually to have an iPhone because that's actually an iPhone 5. I need to really update those slides. Anyway, imagine if somebody, you don't have an iPhone 5 and at, in, in, your, in your birthday, somebody gets you a present and it's the case for the iPhone 5. What are you gonna do with this case? Nothing, right? Or you have an iPhone, somebody gives you a case for a Samsung phone. It's useless, right? You'll probably give it to you, somebody that you know that actually has a Samsung. So it's useless, okay? All right. Now here's another thing about extensions, okay? The extension is the one that's actually aware of the base. Because remember, the base didn't need anything from the extension. And vice versa, in the include relationship, it's the base that was actually aware of the extension. I mean, aware of the details of it. In other words, it's the base that knows, the average function knows, when is it exactly that I need to plug in the sum function, the add function, okay? Again, the sum functions are sitting there twiddling this something, and I don't really care about anything if this happened. Okay. Back again to the extension. The extension here, that case, the people who design it, designing the case, they need to be aware of the exact detail, physical specification of the phone because they're going to create holes and the width and the length with certain specific sizes, all right? So that it's custom made for exactly, all right? If I give you just a generic plastic rubber, chances are it's not good for your phone. Chances are it's not good for any phone to begin with. Okay. Not necessarily always the case, but we'll get to that now. Yes. Is printing what? Printing a receipt, yeah? Yeah, that could be an extension. Okay. So rule of thumb, does it always have to happen? Yes, then it's include. If it doesn't have to happen, right? No, then it's an extent, all right? Even when you think about the malls, right? If you do an extension to a mall, I think Nakheel malls are still an extension, yeah. right? Yeah. In order to build that extension, you have to know the specification of the existing mall so that you can plug in the extension with the existing gate and so on, right? It's not by coincidence that somebody was creating a blueprint of an extension of a mall and saying, oh, look, it actually fits perfectly with Nakheel Mall. And then we have actually an empty land right over there. Great, we'll use that empty land. It doesn't happen like that, right? When the people who created the extension of the mall began day zero, 
they looked at the existing mall. Okay. So we describe optional behavior in the extension. And, okay, so I'm buying a book. Okay. Um, I can give away a t-shirt as some sort of a promotion. So there's a, a valid promotion going on. That's kind of like to get you to buy the book. Okay. Obviously, I don't need to sell the t-shirt. I don't need to give away the t-shirt in order to buy the book, right? Uh, error handling behavior. Okay. Where I'm putting something like really exceptional. Okay. Now I'm going to come to error handling this thing in a moment. Okay. Um, there's two flavors to error handling. Okay. There is a deviation, a slight deviation that's within the realm of the business. And then there's a massive deviation, as you see on the slide over here, that is a little bit outside the realm of this business. Okay. It's like you're standing in front of a, a vending machine, like the ones we have at the bottom, where you want to buy uh, candy or drink or something like that. Okay. And, and, and you ask for uh, a Pepsi. Okay and it doesn't have a Pepsi, right? So you decide I'm gonna get a, a, a Fanta or whatever it is, okay? That's, that's a deviation from the original plan. Your route one was to get the Pepsi, you gotta die Pepsi, all right? It's, it's within the business, okay? You wanted to buy a chicken burger, for example, you just don't want the lettuce. Fine, well, okay, the, the, normal, the normal order is that comes with lettuce, you don't want all the lettuce, okay? Uh, you wanted to buy something uh, you were expected to buy by cash. You decided now I'm going to pay with credit card now. Although now nowadays, actually credit card is the norm, but yeah, you get the idea. Still within the realm of the business, okay? Now, something that a bit outside, a bit extreme, outside the realm of the business is, is you know, you're buying something from the ATM machine, right? You lean on it in the wrong way, and if there was something broken in it in one of the legs, it falls down and falls over your head. Okay, pull over your leg, it breaks it. Okay, then you need to call an ambulance to come and pick you up. Obviously, the whole calling of the ambulance or the vending machine catching fire, we need the civil service to come in, the fire trucks to come. That's way outside the realm of the real business, which is just you were trying to get a Kit Kat. That's all there is to it. Okay, so I don't want to, as a customer or even as a reader of the use case of buy a drink or buy a Kit Kat from the machine. So read text about what happens when the ambulance comes here and do you have, you know, do you have health insurance? All of this stuff, you know, it's, there's no place for me to read over here. You, you want to put it down, okay, just in case that vending machine falls or something. Put it at the very bottom. Okay, I'm going to have a different use case. Slap it at the very bottom of the documentation. If I really if anybody really wants to read it, then they can go ahead and read it. I don't want to be reading it within the same original use case. Okay. So either way, whether an ambulance comes because the vending machine fell on your head or, or you wanted to buy a Kit Kat, but there isn't any and you have to buy a Mars instead, there is uh, you know, a deviation. Deviation means some sort of an if condition has been executed okay so if kit kat was not available do something all right if machine falls on your head then do something out right so there's a condition yes so at the end of the day we're doing a deviation we're, we're branching off from one route doing something it's just how far of a branch is it that we're dealing with okay yes which is what between the, the extreme and the non-extreme? Okay, so, you know, in case the vending machine falls, obviously you wanna, you wanna have, for example, some sort of functionality, maybe that it realized that it tipped over. So it automatically might have a calls for an ambulance, you know, or, or it knows that it catches fire. So it automatically calls for, but you know, think of it as a feature, okay? But it's it's, that feature, that extension feature, is far beyond the normal operational, daily operation of the vending machine. Okay. Now the KitKat thing, oh, you want to buy a KitKat that isn't, do you want to get a bar? Halas, that's that's within the business. Okay. That happens every day 50 times. Not a big deal. Okay. So in case this is the situation, I have certain ways I can write those slight deviation of I didn't find a KitKat and get a Mars. I can write it in the main use case. And that's fine. 
I want to be able to read that. Okay, what happens if I don't find a kid, a, a kid can? Okay, but again, the whole calling of the ambulance because it's far off, it's almost obscuring, it's almost misleading you somewhere else. Then we want to keep it outside. Okay, and this is where you know I want to keep the because it, it may happen, may not happen. I want to keep it outside in an extension use case on its own. All right. And again, I want to warn against function decomposition. Like I said, the case for your iPhone 5, if you just get a, a, a plastic rubber case, a generic one, chances are it's not useful for you. It's not useful for anybody else. Okay. Sometimes it's okay. And, and because it's okay, legally it's allowed. It's just one of those things that, you know, warning, warning, you need to be careful about. You know, for example, that, that t shirt giveaway, I can give away when you're buying a book, I can give away when you're buying a laptop. It could work for both. But nonetheless, Usually one of the characteristics of an extension use case is that it is specifically made for its base. And so if you see it extending a whole bunch of other use cases, then it's one of those that I say, okay, did I actually write this right? Maybe this is an actual includes use case that I didn't know about. Okay, you just need to reconsider that again. All right, now because the extension knows about the base, but the base doesn't know about the extension, you should ask yourself, where is it that I'm going to plug in the extension if I do plug it? Okay. And with the include, I knew because it's the base that actually calls it. So it's the one who makes the call at the, the right area. Okay. You, the one who writes in the code in the function A, this is the time to call function B. But if it's function B who's kind of like volunteering and plugging in its code into function A, it's you got to know function is going to be like, okay, you tell me then where is it that you want to put this? Okay. So what function A does, what the base use case does, it's going to provide something called extension points. Think of those extension points as those USB ports that you have on your laptop. Okay, A USB port is an extension point to this, so you can extend your laptop with another device. Okay, Maybe a wireless mouse or whatever. Okay, Again, if you bought the laptop, okay, and it has those holes on the side, but you never actually bought the what is you can still use the laptop just fine. It didn't need the wireless mouse. Okay. But if you decide to buy it, and I'm expecting that maybe in the future you'll want to be extending my laptop or something else, then here's the proper mechanism. This is the proper place you want to extend it. Don't plug it into the screen. It's gonna break the screen. Plug it into the USB port, please. All right. So the way I'm reading it is um so I'm gonna write the base use case is step number one, two, and then I'll leave a little area for the extension point, okay? Come in the extension use case, in case that condition is true, then I'm gonna take that text over here, I'm gonna plug it into the extension point over there, okay? I'm gonna stop over here and uh, in the next lecture, we're gonna begin talking about the other two, uh, we use mechanisms, generalization, relationship, and the implementation. And likely we're going to begin our exercises on the hands-on exercise on use case moment. Okay. So that's it for today. I'll see you guys on I'll see you, I'll see you Wednesday for the for the quiz. Uh, for the quiz is the...